if you're one of those people that finds the sort of um, bashing of religion and stuff tiresome or uh, offensive, just give me five more minutes. I only read one book, but it's a good book, don't you know? I act the way I act because the good book tells me so. If I want to know how to be good, it's to the good book that I go. Because the good book is a book and it is good and it's a book. Now, these are the nations which the Lord left, to prove Israel by them, so that we may know that it was all Todd's fault, even though it was not Todd's fault, apparently. Even as many of Israel had not known all the wars of Canaan, and every English professor doth facepalm once again because of a sentence that is so poorly worded that no reader doth know what in the bloody hell it is supposed to mean. Only that, the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war for a first person combat video games does not exist at the time, at the least, such as before, knew nothing thereof. Oh, another blessed, piss poorly constructed sentence. Namely, the five lords of the Palestinians, I mean the Philistines, who are bugger all worth mentioning up to this point, and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites, and I shall skip the unimportant bits. And they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether or not they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded by her fathers unto the hand of Moses. Yes, that's an excuse. It's not like we are to serve a Todd that wants her people to live in peace and harmony with commandments that lead to the improvement of overall society. No, no, our religion must be a religion of war, bloodshed, murder, and havoc. And bearest thou in mind this one important fact. I am referring to Judeo Christianity, which is bloody and violent long before Muhammad ever even existed, truly making an Islam a religion of peace, at least by comparison. And the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites, the Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, just in case thou hast not been paying attention at all up to this point. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their daughters to their sons, and served other gods. And this was an in indescribable act of evil, for we all know how Todd hates interracial marriage. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and forgot the Lord their Todd, and served Balaam and the groves, which, as explained in the previous video, was a god of peace and goodness, and a god of weather and agriculture, in direct contrast to Yahweh, a ruthless dark lord of hatred, war, violence, destruction, and bloodshed. And the Israelites to say amongst themselves, Forget the sky, I'm serving Balaam, for I doth want to live in peace and bring in a good harvest. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. Remember that it was Israel's fault for pissing Todd off, not Todd's fault for being too bloody weak to protect her own people like she promised she would. And she sold them to the hand of Gushar-Risha Thayim, king of Mesopotamia, a person who doth not appear in any historical documents outside the Bible. And the children of Israel served Kushan risha Thayim eight years. And the name of this completely unknown person doth mean twice as old wicked Kushan. Kushan apparently means black, and appears to mean that he hails from the kingdom of Kush in Africa, also known as Ethiopia. So if the completely accurate and non-contradictory word of Todd is to be believed, Todd sold the Israelites to the hand of a double-fold wicked black Ethiopian who somehow became the king of Mesopotamia, a land that is nowhere near Africa. Well, that seems legit, does it not? And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord and did ask for a piece of candy, the Lord raised up a deliverer unto the children of Israel who delivered them, which is exactly what thou wouldst expect a deliverer to do. Even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, recall that Othniel, who suddenly reappears in the short section of verses after his hiatus following chapter 1, was a 60-year-old who married his own first cousin. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and just like other folks upon whom the Spirit of the Lord allegedly comes on in modern times, he just fought down on the ground, speaking tongues, pretend to pass out, and generally made a bloody fool out of himself. Oh, but wait. I did not just blaspheme the Holy Ghost, I merely blasphemed the stupid idiots that believe in that non-existent wisp of smoke. And Othniel, who likely did not exist, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, who definitely does not exist, and he went out to war. And the Lord delivered the twice-wicked black Ethiopian king of Mesopotamia to his hand, and his hand prevailed against the twice-wicked black Ethiopian king of Mesopotamia, which seems to suggest that his own hand was against himself. And Othiel did say unto the guy with the ridiculously long name, Why are you hitting yourself, huh? Huh? Why are you hitting yourself, huh? And the land had rest forty years, and Othniel the son of Kenaz died in my arms, 
in the field of Vietnam. And that's all I have to say about that. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, this time by wearing garments of two different types of material woven together. Shame, shame, shame. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of the Moab, against Israel, because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. And once again, we very clearly see that Todd did not take any active steps in the scenario other than to deliberately strengthen Israel's enemies so that the judge can assassinate him in a most horrifying way, which, quite ironically, is the best part of the story so far. And he, I assume that he means Eglon, gathered unto him the children of Ammon and Amalek, a vast child army with loaded AK-47s under the leadership of Joseph Kony, who was most certainly doing the Lord's work, and went out and smote Israel, and possessed the city of palm trees. So the children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, pizza and beer, and cold sodas and candy bars and buffalo wings and legs of lamb for 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, and the Lord raised him up a deliverer to do her dirty work, for it is way too much to ask that an omnipotent deity could simply cause Eglon to have a massive coronary and die on the spot, and the Israelites would once again be free. Instead, she raised up Ehud, son of Gera, who was but all worth mentioning up to this point, and he did stand at the very edge of the stage, the curtain drawn over his face, out of the spotlight, waiting for the director to tell him to come out to the center of the stage. Ehud was a Benjamite, a man left-handed, which means that he was almost as evil as Eglon himself, and by him the children of Israel sent a present unto Eglon, king of Moab, which probably consisted of even more food. But Ehud made him a dagger and did show it unto his friend Crocodile Dundee. And Dundee did say unto Ehud, That's not a knife! And Crocodile Dundee did pull out his own dagger, a foot and a half long stainless steel, double bladed number with shredded edges and a hilt made of kangaroo leather, and a compass in the stock and the sting which tells time. And he did say unto Ehud, Oh, that's a knife! And Ehud did gird it under his garment upon his right thigh, and Dundee did answer and say unto him, Brother Deacon Bruce, but that ever is a good hiding spot. And he brought the president unto Eglon, king of Moab, and Eglon was a very fat man as evidenced by the fact that his name actually means calf-like, as in a small cow in ancient Hebrew. And when he had made an end to offer the present of cold beer and buffalo wings, he sent away the people that bear the present. For as they were bugger all worth mentioning in the story, the author did not see fit to even give them proper names. But he himself, uh, he himself being Ehud, I think, the man with the big bloody knife and the cleverly concealed hiding spot, turned again from the quarries that were by Gilgal and said, I have a secret errand unto thee, O king. And the king says, Well, that seems legit. There certainly appeared to be no reason to suspect any foul play up to this point, so I'm just going to have to trust thee that thou does not have a large knife tucked into thy knickers, and I will just order my personal bodyguards to walk away, for they have a very important meeting with the local, ahem, escort service. And all that stood by him did shrug and exited the scene, stage left. And Ehud came unto him, and he was sitting in a summer parlor, which he had for himself alone. And thou knowest that it must be one of those fancy European numbers, for it is spelled O-U-R. And did sit there with his cold beer and buffalo wings and the Raider game upon his flat-screen television. And he did say unto Ehud, Welcome to the man cave. What kind of sauce do you want in your sausage? And Ehud said, I have a message from God unto thee, and this is no way to be construed as a direct blasphemy against Almighty Todd. And he arose out of his seat, but the absolutely accurate, non contradictory inspired word of Almighty Todd specified not who did the standing in this verse. And Ehud, whether he was the one standing or not, we cannot tell, put forth his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh. And the king was thoroughly impressed by this particular piece of hardware, and he said to him, Whoa, that's a knife! And Ehud thrust the knife into his belly, by which we can probably presume that it means the king's belly, and not Ehud's and the haft, whatever the hell a haft is, went in after the blade, and the fat closed upon the blade so that he could not draw the dagger out of his belly, for that will recall, Eglon King of Moab was a very fat man. And the dirt came out, for though it bears repeating again that the Bible is absolutely accurate word of Todd, this is one instance in which, frankly, a decent euphemism is acceptable for a book that is supposedly completely family-friendly. 
Certainly, one now wants to describe a politically motivated assassination of the ruler of a foreign country in exquisite detail. Now, certainly would not want to tell little children who are undoubtedly reading the Bible for themselves the very instant that they learn how to read that when Eglon Kingamo was stabbed in the gut with the blood gushing out everywhere and Eglon was screaming and carrying on like a little bitch as probably guards did not hear his cries for help because they were all out scheduling appointments with local prostitutes that King Eglon, in the painful throes of death, shed himself all over the place. Then Ehud went forth through the porch and shut the doors of the parlor behind him, and locked them, and bugger all do any biblical scholars know how he obtained the king to the door, or what he did with it. When he was gone out, his servants came in, we can only presume that this means Ehud's servants and not Iglon's. Oh, wait, is that supposed to be the other way around? Hmm. Well, anyway, someone's servants came, and when they saw that, behold, the doors of the parlor were locked, one of the servants said, Surely he covered up his feet in the summer chamber. And another servant did answer and say, Beg pardon? What in the bloody hell did that mean? And the third servant answered, I think it meaneth that he's taken a nap. And they tarried until they were ashamed. Though why servants would be nervous when their employers should take a nap in the server parlor is completely beyond my comprehension. Just let them sleep and go and schedule yet another appointment with the escort service. And behold, he opened not the doors of his parlor, which is understandable, for he would have been dead for quite some time, and surely by this time the stench of his drying blood, urine, and feces would have been overwhelming. And the servants did try to open the door, but behold, it was still locked. And the first servant said, Jerry, do you have a key to the store? And the second servant, apparently named Jerry, answered, Nah, man, I give it to George. And they asked George, who told him that he placed it underneath the doormat, and they lifted up the doormat and found the spare key to the door. And they took the key and opened the door, and behold, in an overly dramatic scene straight off of a bad movie, they found the Lord, falling dead upon the earth, lying in a pool of his own blood and feces. And I swear to thee, the smell was worse than the sight, I tell thee what. And the Moabites implemented stricter security measures up to that point, including TSA agents, metal detectors, and bomb-sniffing military working dogs. And now thou knowest why TSA agents take the trouble to carefully inspect thy inner thighs. And Ehud escaped while the chariot and passed beyond the quarries, and escaped unto Sirath. And it came to pass when he was come that he blew a trumpet in the mountain of Ephraim. And the children of Israel, who were all but absent in this ridiculous narrative, went down with them from the mount, and he before him, and know this is also not a run-on sentence. And he said unto them, Follow after me, for the Lord hath delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And this seemed perfectly legit, as it fell directly in line with the last time Ehud invoked his religion to justify violence against others. And it went down after him, just like any other mob following a violent, charismatic religious leader, and took the fords of Jordan toward Moab and pushed them somewhere else. And they suffered not a man to pass over. And they slew of Moab at the time about ten thousand men, all lusty, all men of valor, and they escaped not a man. And this begs the question of why in the bloody hell did they not do that before? So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest fourscore years, but trust us, me, this will not be the last time Israel gets into trouble. And after him, him being Judge Ehud, was Shamgar, son of Anath, who is so important to this 3,000-year-old book of Steuben that he actually warrants a mention in a single verse. Which, I think the Bible means who, slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goat. And he also delivered Israel, from whom the Bible did not say, but appeared to be at least as impressive as slewing 600 men with an ox goat. But then again, that is nothing compared to the rest of the ridiculous claims in this book of Stupid, which probably explains why there is only a single verse dedicated to this virtually unknown individual. I tried to read some other books, but I soon gave up on that. The paragraphs ain't numbered and they complicate the facts. I can't read Harry Potter because they're worshipping false gods and that. And Dumbledore's a poofter, and that's bad because it's not good. 